If you've clicked on this video, your journey into miniature painting likely involves watching countless 10 minute YouTube videos on all these different topics and trying to relate and connect all of these small dots of knowledge. And maybe you've even experienced being a little bit frustrated along the way. Because inevitably there's going to be some gap between what we can watch professional painters do on a video and what we're able to do ourselves on our miniatures. And so we may get stuck in this weird limbo where we have a lot of cool recipes and a bunch of tips and tricks, but we really don't know what's holding us back. And we might feel frustrated with our results because we're depending and relying too much on these tips and tricks and always following the same recipes. And so we get stuck in this place because every time we step out of our comfort zone, the results look like shit. Does this description sound like you? Well, then you're not alone. Trust me, I was there. Many of the people I talked to are there. And hopefully today I can propose a solution to this problem. Let's imagine a child that wants to learn how to play an instrument. We'll call him Bob. Now, Bob wants to learn how to play the clarinet. So Bob signs up for lessons at the music school. Every week, Bob will come in for lessons and he'll spend about an hour with his teacher who will give him homework assignments to practice for next week and keep track of his progress week to week. There's a great many things Bob has to learn before being a virtuoso at the clarinet. Bob will have to learn technique, music theory, scales, arpeggios, ear training, how to read sheet music and how to put that all together and play different songs. And through the curriculum set by Bob's music teacher, Bob will gradually improve in all of these skills simultaneously. Now, this way of teaching music that Bob is taught is a tried and true method that's been used for hundreds of years. Now, let's imagine a different child. We'll call her Susan. Susan wants to learn how to play the saxophone. And instead of going to music school, Susan goes on YouTube and watches tons of videos with some of the best saxophonists in the world. Where Bob only has one teacher, Susan has hundreds. So, Susan should be better, right? Well, in worst case, Susan is gonna end up frustrated and kind of confused by all the different things she has to learn. After all, she has to learn the same skill set that Bob has to do. Music theory, scales, arpeggios, ear training, sheet music, and actually playing songs. But there's another possibility as well, which is that Susan gets pretty good and gets pretty good at the things that she enjoys practicing. And while Susan gets good at some things, there are other things that she neglects, the things she don't find as interesting and the things that she doesn't see a immediate need for learning how to do. And this happens because she doesn't have the luxury of having a teacher that puts her through a set curriculum, which means that at some point in Susan's musical journey, she's gonna be hit with some frustrating situations. Now, I've spoken to the importance of having a good teacher or a community to rely on before, and if you haven't seen that video, you can go ahead and check it out through the top comment down in the comment section. The point that I'm trying to drive home with this story about Bob and Susan is really twofold. Firstly, I don't think that YouTube is a great platform for educational content. I think that it's great for surface level education, and I think that it's great for variety and entertainment, but sometimes we have to eat our vegetables and not just the candy and the chocolate ice cream. And through this algorithm of snappy titles and engaging thumbnails, there are some basic foundations that are bound to be lost. Which is why I hope that you'll consider joining me over on Patreon, where I have a much better platform for teaching you how to paint miniatures. Which brings us to the second and probably the most important point. The frustration you may be feeling about not being able to get better comes from a poor understanding of the skills that go into miniature painting. You simply don't understand the foundational skills that you're missing because more than likely the way you've been introduced to this skill and this art form is through an education that looks more like Susan's and less like Bob's. And so let's talk about these foundations and I'll propose a concrete practice that you can do to level up your understanding of these foundational skills. And it actually starts with drawing. And I wanna make a promise to you that if you spend five to 10 hours drawing over the course of a month, you'll see an exponential growth in your miniature painting. You see, in the traditional art world, drawing is considered the foundations of all other art. And that's because drawing is the language for light and volume. You couldn't imagine a painter that would be able to paint a portrait or a landscape without being able to draw it first. If the drawing isn't there, the painting isn't there. And so I believe that there's a lot we can learn from drawing as miniature painters. And it's not like we can't learn about light and volume through miniature painting alone, but I believe that by switching the medium, we can bypass some of the bad habits that we have in miniature painting and some of the things that are holding us back and gain an insight that would otherwise be much more difficult to achieve through miniature painting alone. And now I know some of you are thinking that you don't wanna draw because you're not good at it, because you simply just suck at drawing. And to those of you, I would say, good. 
I suck at drawing as well. And you see, here's just the thing. We don't need to get good at drawing. We just need to understand how it's done and maybe have a little bit of practice with it. We're miniature painters. We're looking to get good at miniature painting. And again, if we're investing just a little bit of time into this skill, I promise you that it'll pay off exponentially in miniature painting, which is what we're all really here for. So please stick with me, okay? What is it that we can learn from drawing that's so important? I believe that it's three skills that are absolutely essential to us as miniature painters. First is volumes, lights, and then lastly, we can learn how to sketch. Now, volumes and lights I've already mentioned, and you probably know a little bit about this beforehand. So this should be fairly easy. Whereas this approach of sketching, of working from the general to the specific, of the big picture to the smaller details, I think is immensely valuable for miniature painters. I wanted to start this topic of drawing by giving you two different perspectives. In 1979, Betty White wrote Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. The book became a huge success, a New York Times bestseller, and partly because of some pretty bold claims in this book that drawing is not some innate skill that some people are born with and some are born without. Rather, what's keeping us from actually getting good at drawing, it's our presuppositions of what we're seeing and our preconceived notions of what we're looking at. So if you just learn how to see correctly, then you'll be able to draw correctly. And therefore, Betty White uses techniques such as flipping our references upside down or drawing using negative space to teach her students how to become better at drawing. So in short, Betty Edwards teaches us how to draw what we're seeing. This is also what's called drawing from observation. Another perspective on drawing is the constructionists. The constructionists said that drawing from observation is all well and good, but it's a little bit like building a building without solid foundations. And furthermore, we as artists need to be able to do more than draw from observation. And I read every word of that book. And it was about halfway through that my heart started to sink. It's not gonna teach me how to draw out of my imagination. But the book offered me nothing for how to invent out of imagination. Imagine you're an artist having to draw a comic book in 1980 before the internet. Would you then get a model to pose for every single frame? And would you do the characters design by finding quirky models and then drawing them? And this all seems like way too hard to do, not to mention that it would be too expensive as well. The constructionists say that drawing from observation is not enough. We have to understand the structure of the object. They say that if we only follow this approach that Betty Edwards lays out, the best case scenario is that we become secondhand cameras that are able to reproduce reality, but we're not able to create something original or to create something that's actually worthy of being called art. And so we can ask ourselves, who is right in this discussion? And the answer is, of course, both. If you want to learn how to draw, you have to be able to draw both from observation and as well as construction. So we need to draw what we see and what we know is there. Because no reference is perfect and after all, this interpretation is what makes drawing an art form. When the artist chooses what to include and what not to include in the drawing. So let's talk about how to actually do this practice. The first step is to find a reference. And then you can start by drawing an envelope. An envelope is a simple shape of three to five lines that are to straight. This could usually just be a box. And here you're just focusing on getting the same relationship between the height and the width of the object down on the piece of paper. From then you can start to cut into the envelope. And here comes the important part. You squint at the subject in order to reduce the shapes of the lights and the shapes of the darks. You then draw out the shadow shapes and you can measure the shapes and the placements of these in the relationship to the reference. So if you're drawing the face, like here for example, you can look for different hallmarks like the edge of the iris or the corner of the mouth or the tip of the nose and measure placements of different features and the shadow shapes in accordance to these hallmarks. This technique about measuring and finding the correct proportions is really not as important to us as miniature painters, so I'll graze over it a little bit. What is important, however, is squinting at the subject and reducing the shapes of the shadows and reducing the shapes of the lights. And so let's have a look at a simple exercise on how I draw like this. Okay, so here you can see the reference I'm drawing down in the bottom corner. I'm drawing this cup. And uh, the first step again is to do the envelope. So I'm just looking for the corners and make, making a rough shape that's roughly the same height and width as the cup. Once I have that, I'm going to look for angles so I can carve into each side of the envelope and look for the angle of the sides of the cup. I then decide to push the bottom of the cup a little bit further down. And again, still kind of just looking for the right relationship between the different proportions and drawing in simple volumes. Now, once I have a shape, I think that kind of fits with the reference. I can commit a little bit harder to it by using 
uh, harder strokes with the pencil and uh, ultimately erasing some of these um, guidelines that I've set up from the envelope. Okay, so from here, it's really about blocking in the shadow and highlight shapes. And it's really important to uh, remember to squint at the subject and just try to simplify these relationships between the shadows and the lights as much as possible. And here you can again see the reference and how it looks when you squint at it. So your brain kind of makes things very simple for you when you do this. And just uh, drawing this simple version of the drawing first and then adding the details later on is uh, incredibly helpful. Let me skip ahead a bit where I drawn in the cup that lays behind. And now I can just fill in sort of the shadow shapes with just a flat tone. I'm not worrying about the differences in value uh, in the shadows themselves just yet, but really just uh, kind of blocking in very simple shapes here. All those nuances of how different values in the shadows and the lights and the midtones and the half tones and all that stuff, all that comes later. So yeah, at this point the block in is finished and we can start to look more towards the half tones or what we would call mid tones in miniature painting. I grab a softer pencil for darkening the darkest values to add a little bit more depth to the shadow. Especially this dark reflection here on the middle of the cup is very dark. And whenever things get too dark, we can use the eraser to kind of carve out a little bit of the light and bring a little bit of that light back again. You can use a finger or another piece of paper to blend some of these uh, strokes. And that's pretty much it. Okay, so I've shown you how to draw and I highly encourage you to go practice this method by yourself, find a reference or find an object in real life and try to draw using this approach. Another helpful drawing exercise you could also do is to imagine a light source and some different shapes, maybe a box, and try to look at the box from different perspectives and rotate it around the light source. This understanding of the volume and the fall of the light will also help you in your miniature painting. And before we move on, I want to briefly mention pen and ink drawing. I think this medium is super inspiring. What's so cool about pen and ink drawing is that it's a permanent medium, meaning that every stroke the artist puts down is permanent. And most everything in pen and ink is done with painting lines. And so I think there's some parallel between how we use our brush to create our brush strokes and how the pen and ink drawers use their brush to create their lines in their painting. For instance, if you're drawing a round shape, you never want to use flat lines. This will flatten out the shape and kind of ruin the effect of the roundness of the 3D object. Rather, you want to use curved lines that accentuate and pronounce the form. I also think that the way that they build texture in pen and ink drawing is very similar to the way that we're building texture on the models in miniature painting. So I think there's definitely a video here on this topic. And if you want to see that video, go ahead and let me know in the comments and that I'll be sure to make that. Okay, with all this drawing out of the way, let's talk about how to actually apply this knowledge to painting miniatures. We can start by simplifying the whole figure. That means ignoring the details and ignoring the local colors of different areas and painting the whole figure in one go instead of painting element by element. 
We can approach the miniature by painting the lights and the shadows instead of hanging around so much in the midtones. So choose one color for your lights, choose one color for your shadows. The contrast doesn't have to be huge, just as long as it's clearly distinguishable which one is which. And don't mix these paints on the palette. Use them straight out of the bottle and separate the lights from the shadows. You can try to paint this with as few brush strokes as possible. Again, thinking about pen and ink drawing, what if every brush stroke was permanent? And most importantly, you can squint at the general view of the miniature in order to get a better understanding of the volumes and the placement of the lights instead of zooming in on the details immediately. Let me show you how I put these steps in practice on this Space Marine. The first step in sketching this Space Marine is to cover the whole miniature with a base coat of the shadow tone. Now, I've already painted the face on this model, and if you wanna see how I did that, there is a PDF guide available on the Patreon for that. And so I will base coat the entire model using violet, and then I'll come in with some pure samurai green for the lights. And so that means that everywhere we see the samurai green, we will see some form of light, either a mid-tone or a highlight. For now, I'm only concerned with blocking in the shapes of the shadows and the shapes of the lights. And now, this step doesn't take a long time, but it is so essential to understanding and practicing this process. And it's probably the most important lesson that you can take from this video. Make things as simple for yourself when you're starting out as possible. So please, pay special attention to this blocking stage. Once I've blocked in the shadows and the lights, I will then do a mix of the violet and the samurai green to get this blue color, and this will be the midtones. This can either be darker midtones when we put it over the violet, or be brighter midtones when it goes on top of the samurai green. And again, while I'm painting this, I take special care to squint at the miniature and look at it from far away, always to gauge if this general impression is working or not. I will then strengthen the lights using a mixture of samurai green and ice yellow. And reinforce the final highlights with pure ice yellow. Let's take a look at the finished sketch. As you can see, it's quite ugly. The brush strokes are kind of messy and nothing is really smooth or nice looking yet. But if we squint at it or use the Gaussian blur effect, which kind of mimics the effect of squinting, and if we compare it to the picture of the finished miniature, we can see that the placement of lights is lining up correctly. And we can also see that the overall scheme works. And so before we continue, making this sketch took me about 30 minutes and depending on your level and how used to this process you are, it might take you longer or maybe even shorter time. Whereas refining and blending the rest of the miniature took me about six hours. And so this is what I see most often with people that are struggling with blending and refining, is that they don't have the experience to trust the slow process of blending. And when we're painting for six hours and things are going very slowly, it's incredibly easy to get frustrated along the way and kind of lose faith in the process of blending. Especially because a big part of these six hours is fixing your own mistakes. But hopefully as you spend more and more time on the miniature, the mistakes you're fixing become smaller and smaller until at the end you have a nice polished result. Anyway, enough yapping, let me show you how I blend. Let me first show you the consistency of the paints. Here I'm working with very very thin paint and I load a little bit into the tip of the brush, I'll then wipe it off on a paper towel and then I can test the opacity and the flow of the paint on my finger or on my fingernail like this. I'm going for relatively transparent paints and so I think this dilution looks about right. I start by painting small lines that will connect the different gradients in sort of a braid. 
So violet lines will intersect with blue lines and blue lines will intersect with green lines. I'll always work with the darkest section and then move upwards in the value scale. So violet, blue, green, then back to violet, then blue, and then green again, and then repeat this process a few times. This helps to build coverage in each of the gradients and also helps to smoothen the blend. I'll then eventually move up the scale to green, ice yellow and green and pure ice yellow, and then repeat this pattern again a few times. And especially once we go into the brighter highlights, we're painting with smaller strokes and maybe even just these tiny dots. And this is really the smallest possible mark I can make with the brush is simply just to dot the brush at the surface. This is because we of course want the highlight to take up a smaller amount of space than the midtones and the shadows. And so in this way we're blending not with glazes but with a building of a texture that's very fine and translucent and as we layer this texture on top of each other, in the end we'll get a result that looks smooth. In the end, I might do a little bit of glazing, but that's really just in the midtones. Here I come in with some ultramarine blue from Schmincke, that's also a transparent paint, and glaze in just a little bit of the midtones and the shadows. I want to take special care with this glaze not to hit the highlights. You see, when we're glazing in with paints, uh, the best method is to use a paint that's as close to the surface that you're looking at in value. So the ultramarine blue works much better over green than it does over white, since the difference between green and blue is much smaller in value than white and blue, for instance. Now, rather than show you the painstaking six hours that it took for me to blend this miniature, let's go ahead and skip ahead a bit. But just know that this is the exact process I did all over the miniature to blend everything. For the gold trim, I take special care to place the highlights alongside the bottoms of the reflections that you're seeing on the shoulder pad. So I make sure to have the brightest spots here. And I even add this bounce light from the reflection from the gold in the blue shoulder pad. And if the reflection looks too strong, I can always glaze in some blue to cover it. I want to take a moment to thank all of my wonderful patrons. You guys are the best. And if you're enjoying this video so far, I want to invite you to join me over on my Patreon, where we have exclusive content in both longer and shorter formats, a community discord, and even some opportunity for some private coaching and feedback from me as well. So if you're serious about getting better at painting, I think there's no better way to do it than to sign up for the Patreon. Anyway, let's get back to the painting. Because of the posture of this space marine, we can imagine most of the legs being in darkness, since he's essentially leaning in over the bottom of his legs. So the front planes of these legs will really be facing the ground. And here we can add a little bit of OSL to fill in some of these shadows. And so this is a cool detail that we can use to add a little bit of information and a little bit of interest to these shadow tones. So I'll add some OSL coming from the base that we'll paint later on. 
Here I'm coming in with some magenta and some white for this and again violet for the shadows. Now the Chimera and the Schmincke Magenta have both of them the same pigment inside, but they have different properties. So the Chimera paint is matte and has stronger coverage, whereas the Schmincke paint is more translucent and has more of a satin finish. This means that it'll be really good for glazing and for blending, whereas the Chimera will be better for sketching in the general shape of the lights. So again, I start the same layering process by layering layers of magenta and violet in the beginning and then gradually adding more magenta and white as we get brighter. And again, the process is the same of painting these tiny lines in order to blend and create this fine texture that we're layering on top of each other until we have a smooth gradient. And a little bit of glazing in the end to adjust. The glazing is really there more to filter less than it is to build opacity. The base I built from some cork and some various small bits and stones. I put on some liquid green stuff in order to soften some of the very heavy texture that's going on on the base. I also put down this large skull because I thought it could be cool to have this as the source of the OSL. And besides, when you're painting a GW miniature, you always need to add another skull, right? I'll check the position of the skull in the space marine to be sure I have a composition I like before gluing the skull in place and priming and starting with the painting of the base. For the painting I'm using violets for the shadows, I know, what a surprise. <laughs> and I'll then come in with some black leather from scale 75 to add a little bit of grayness to the stones. Before painting the skull white with the brush and coming in with a little bit of white ink through the airbrush to create this glow effect. And I'll then cover the area of the white with the magenta through the airbrush. And I'll go back and forth a little bit between highlighting with the brush and covering the color with magenta. A little bit of violet glaze through the airbrush to shadow and to add a little bit of depth to the base and to darken down some of the overspill from the airbrush. I 
I then glued the miniature to the base and called him finished. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you have, I hope you'll consider signing up for the Patreon, or at least leaving a comment, subscribing, or sharing this video with a friend. It all helps. Thank you so much, here is the finished Space Marine, and have a painting.